right, everybody. Thanks for your patience. It's great to great to see you. Great to be joined by uh, great alumni and excited to get to know you a little bit. We're going to go ahead and start the program. I am your host, uh, Jeff Minhas. I'm executive director of the UCI Alumni Association, proud UCI alumnus, and excited to bring a, one of these uh, events that's going to be really fun tonight. We've got a couple of fantastic alumni who are uh, I have no doubt are going to be uh, great presenters and should give us a, a great program. So welcome. This is our second virtual wine tasting. And today we're featuring Rob Lloyd from Lloyd Cellars, which is located in Napa, California. We have a lot of wine education and cheersing on the agenda for tonight, including a brief history on how Lloyd Cellars came to be. Rob's special take on wine creation and the tasting demonstration. Also, be sure to stay till the end of the event for an exciting giveaway opportunity. We've got a really nice prize and one lucky winner from all of you who registered tonight. So uh, logistically, you're all gonna be muted for the time in order to be, in order to eliminate background noise and interference during the program. Since we have a large group from all over, and I know more are gonna be uh, trickling in, uh, I invite you to pop in the chat and at, you know, now share where you're from, share your class year, and uh, whatever what your other connections to UCI may be. Um, you can use the chat to also submit questions for a Q&A portion that we're going to have at the end of the hour or towards the end of the hour. So in the chat, introduce yourself and use it for questions and answers as well. Now, before we begin, I'd like to make the introduction for our wine expert and primary speaker for the night, Rob Lloyd. Upon graduating from UCI and Davis, Rob landed a position as, excuse me, as enologist and then assistant winemaker at La Crema Winery in Sonoma County. He later became the assistant winemaker at Napa Valley's Rombauer Estate from 2001 to 2003. The associate winemaker from 2003 to 2006 and the winemaker from 2006 to 2008. Ready to make uh, wines the way he prefers, Rob and his wife Bonnie established Lloyd Cellars in 2008. In 2014, they launched Prescription Vineyards with fruit sourced from longtime collaborator and grower, James Reamer. One of his industry colleagues and fellow UCI alumnus, Greg Moore, is joining us for the beginning part of this program as well. Greg met Rob at a party in 1989, and they soon became great friends. After many years achieving success in their respective careers, they were finally able to work together. So Greg joined Lloyd Sellers in 2016 as director of sales. Now Rob makes great wine, Greg sells it, and they have a lot of fun working together. It certainly sounds that way. So everyone, please join me in giving Rob and Greg a great big Virtual Anteater, welcome. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Hey there. <laughs> welcome, yeah, we, gentlemen. We, you know, when, when you meet somebody, you know, at a, a fraternity party down <laughs> in Newport Beach, and the first thing that happens is you get shoulder tapped by the police asking you if you live here. I mean, what better profession for the two of us to have than, you know, to actually make and drink wine together? So, cheers. Cheers. And thanks for having us on. Yeah, like it's, it. our, it's our pleasure. All right, and I'm glad you mentioned that. I was going to have to ask about the party where you met because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that was a, uh, a rager if the police were, not, were uh, tapping your shoulders. Oh. That, that was actually the after party. I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we want to get to know you a little bit before we get into your presentation. So uh, I don't know about that. That could get really bad. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know. Maybe we'll just talk. Should we just talk about wine? I mean, getting to know us then. <laughs> there are a few people on there that do, and I, they might not want to get to know us anymore. The, the old friends that, that know us and that have actually signed up for this. That's yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay. We well, I'm at, at risk of getting to know you, I'm going to crack the door open on this a little bit. I want to start by asking you what your favorite one or two UCI memories are. Oh, well, the one brain cell that's left from UCI uh, is, uh, you know, I'm trying to, one of, probably my favorite one was, you know, some of the, you know, the times that we had down on the beach, 
um, you know, when, when I got to UC Irvine and, and quickly figured out, wait, if you take 12 units every quarter, it takes you exactly five years to graduate. This is a nice place to live. I like UCI. I like UCI so much, I went for five years. Uh, that might be my favorite memory is the beach. Uh, I only made it four and a quarter. Um, <laughs> He was the but, smart one. Yeah, the smart one. But uh, we had this great house that that I was living in on on 48th and Seashore. And then Rob Rob moved into my room when yeah. I moved out. But yeah, just our weekends at 48th Street with our old roommate, Alan, who was the uh, unfortunate recipient of our late night visit from the police that night after Rob and I jumped <laughs> over the railing and ran away out down the beach. Uh, but just uh, yeah, I'd say our, our weekends there at, at Newport Beach, just hanging out with friends and enjoying the sunshine and getting a great anteater education. Yes. So cheers. So uh, I can resonate with the five-year plan. There were many of us who had a lot of fun, didn't want to leave. And look at me, I'm still here. But but guys, <laughs> shout out the fraternity. Let's let's hear it. Shout shout your guys out. Hey, Jeff. So, I mean, I guess we could call you Bluto if you're you know still in school. Uh, yeah. Why John not? Blutarski. Yeah, he's still oh, there. Blue from old school. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Let's see who's uh let's see who's on here from our old crew. Mr. Mr. Kwan, Mr. Sable, Mr. Harvey. Good to see you all. Who else we got here? Gary Schwartz. All right. Nice. Well, it's good to see some old friends here. And uh hopefully we'll see you guys up here in Napa too. So yeah, actually, I mean, you know, quite a few of those guys were a part of 4801 Seashore. They know what we're talking about. <laughs> they were there. They might have been at the party too, huh? Yeah. I think there might have been some other five-year people in, in that. Did Kwan graduate? I don't know. <laughs> Not sure about that either. Sorry to out you, Jim. And what fraternity are you in? Phi Delta Theta. Phi Delta Theta. All right. Good stuff. So when you did eventually graduate after five or four and a quarter, uh, no dig. Uh, did you plan on going into the wine industry? I'm going to ask that to Rob. No, I, I, I unfortunately had to leave Newport Beach. Uh, my family had moved to Napa when I went down to Irvine. And so I came up to Napa and thought it'd be fun to learn about wine before I got a real job um, and never, I guess, got that real job. I uh, worked at Cake Bread and was like, oh my God, you can actually make a, I mean, I was really good at drinking it, but I didn't know you could make a living making it. And so um, once I found that out, um, worked a few more harvests and then went up to uh, UC Davis that had the enology program and, uh, and entered the enology program. Uh, it took about two years, it took me three years of background chemistry because uh, at Irvine I had a degree in economics and business management. Um, so needed a few more classes, but after graduating, um, you know, luckily I had met my wife. Um, somehow she married me, talked her into it. But, um, you know, and ever since then, just been up here and, and loving it. And then as we started expanding our business, um, realized I was, I, I really like making it. I don't like selling it. And I'd known Greg since I was 19 and, and he'd been in sales the whole time. So he joined us and it's been a lot of fun. I mean, he's, not just our sales guy, but you know he's my youngest daughter's godfather. So we've been having a lot of fun for a lot of years, and um, now we just you know make the stuff that we drink rather than buying something else. You know, a lot less Coors Light now. That's true. I love it. Well, well, Rob, uh, just more specifically, what training or accreditations go into becoming a winemaker? I, you know, I I did go and get my master's in fermentation science. Um, you know, I know guys that have just, you know, worked, you, you, it takes, you basically have one harvest per year. So, you know, when I started my first harvest uh, was 93, um, you know, and I thought, you know, if I was lucky, you know, I could get 50 harvests in. So you basically get 50 tries at, you know, making wines and you start realizing, you know, only 50 tries to try and make something that, you know, is great uh, before you die. It's not, not too many tries. So it's, um, you know, it's a lot of fun, and but I mean, it is, uh, it, it goes by quickly. Okay. All right. Well, so now both of you are in the industry. Um, what, ha, what's your favorite unique experience or story in the wine industry? 
You want me to go? Favorite unique story? <laughs> you go. You're the wine. Yeah. You're the winemaker. I'm just a sales guy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we we the audience knows enough about you already that you have plenty of unique stories in the wine industry. Uh, you know, well, I guess the the earliest one was I had just come up from Irvine and was working at uh, Cake Bread, and um, the guys that were there said, uh, you know make sure the wine's okay. And I said, okay, what do I have to do? And they said, put your nose in the bunghole. And I said, excuse me, uh, these fighting words. And I found out that actually the hole in the top of the barrel is called the bunghole. Um, so that was my first intro to uh, winemaking. <laughs> All right, Greg. <laughs> I'd say the first, that. <laughs> the, the, the first time that Rob took me wine tasting, he decided to take me to uh, Silver Oak and I'd never, been wine tasting before and didn't really know a whole lot about wine and this was back when Silver Oak didn't they had a very small tasting room and the people that worked there were pretty uh I don't snooty, know, snooty <laughs> but yeah that's a good word uh, and Rob takes his glass of wine and they pour the wine for you and they look at you and expect you to say the right thing and he does the swirl and he does the smell tastes the wine and he spouts out some ridiculous thing like <laughs> jammy and fruit forward with, you know, cherry under Dill with hints of pickle. Yeah, it tastes like a Newport picnic or something like that. And I'm <laughs> thinking in my head the whole while, while through, I'm watching him knowing I'm in sales going, oh, I can swirl my glass and I can smell it. And then when he got to that, I was thinking in inner monologue, oh no. So I uh, swirled and I smelled and I tasted the wine and I proudly said, tastes like chicken. <laughs> and the lady slammed the bottle down and turned around and walked out of the room <laughs> while Rob's trying not to laugh, saying, I want to have a career in this industry, yeah. you idiot. Don't and, get me kicked out already. Yeah. And at Rob's rehearsal dinner for his wedding, a few years later, I heard uh, from across the a crowded room, I heard his dad say, tastes like chicken. And about 50 people start laughing and <laughs> they were all pointing at me. So that's followed me around for quite a while. Oh, that's classic. Oh, man. We, yeah, I, I can't wait one day to, to come up and go wine tasting with you. You guys are uh, a fun bunch. So speaking of places to go wine tasting, what are some of the best places in Napa to go wine tasting? Uh, well, I would highly recommend two places, and they're both in the town of Yauntville, which is in uh, the center of the valley. One is called Handwritten, and the other one is Jessup Cellars. Uh, and I recommend those because along with making uh, our Lloyd wine and prescription, I've been making both of those wines for about 12 years now. Um, so they have beautiful tasting rooms right in the heart. And I mean, you know, one of them is a stone's throw from French Laundry, where uh, if you sell your firstborn child, you can actually get a reservation. Um, but the food is very good. But as long as you didn't like that firstborn child, it's fine. Ski, they'll make you a, a discount. You know, maybe you can, the, the, the one that's going uh, for the karate lessons. Um, but yeah, both, <laughs> both very, very nice uh, taste rooms. And it is fun. We, we don't have uh, Lloyd Sellers taste room. You just basically have to come up to Napa and drink with Greg and I, even though I think we've invited Quan and Sable and uh, I'm, yeah. I'm going to, you know, harass. You know, no shows. Yeah. I mean, you would think, you know, their 18 year old cells are so upset. Free wine for you and your wives. And you haven't come up to visit Greg and I. Shame on you. Yeah. Just up and handwritten too. Rob, Rob's kind of making the whole gamut on the varietals too. We focus on Chardonnay and, and Pinot and Cabernet, um, but really great tasting experiences, lots of different choices too. So awesome, two awesome places to go. All right, awesome places to go. Thanks for the recommendations. Uh, now we wanna get some info from the audience. We wanna get to know you. Who has been Napa, Napa or excuse me, wine tasting in Napa wine country before? So there should be a poll popping up in your Zoom there. Quick yes or no. Who's been up to Napa? I have not. I've only been to Temecula. I, I am not the sophisticated wine person. So let's hear about everybody else. Jeff, you have to, you, you know, it's the only way to learn. You've got to come in, up and start drinking with us. It's yeah. Definitely practice makes perfect. Yeah. All right. So even though, even though your boys haven't been... Uh, to see you we've got 90 percent of the audience has been wine tasting in napa before so we've got a experienced audience last weekend yeah okay so now we're going to transition into the next part of the event we're going to learn i'm going to stop talking we're going to learn from uh from rob and greg here so uh 
let's go ahead and get that started. I like it. Who's that clown? First of all, these pictures are great because you get like a 20 year age range <laughs> between the first three photos. Yeah. <laughs> that one wasn't that, that long ago. That, that, but that's post post pandemic yeah. or pre pandemic, pardon yeah. me. <laughs> All right, well, oh, so well, and this is, you know, with my assistant winemaker, Bernardo, standing in a uh, open top tank. So, I mean, you know, here's just, you know, a little background. And it was, you know, my dad um, had always been, you know, drinking big, rich Chardonnay. So even before, you know, being the winemaker at Rombauer, I was, you know, drinking that style of Chard. And as uh, we keep getting into this, I don't know if you know, we have some people that are, have got some prescription wines and then some of the Lloyd wines, but you know, both are, are very, very big, rich Chardonnays. And that's obviously what, you know, we like to drink and what I like to make. So and we'll move into kind of the, the second one, because a lot of these are kind of going over, um, you know, what, a little bit what we just talked about when we, uh, when we started this program. Ah, uh, God, that clown again. See, that's... Yep. So this is kind of, you know, basically what happened after um, I left Irvine. It was very difficult to leave leave 4801 seashore it was a pretty darn nice place but luckily moving up to napa wasn't too bad and you know kind of finding out you know that i could make a living at making wine we we'll kind of keep cruising through these now you can see why i said i was very lucky to marry my wife because she's very sweet and very beautiful luckily greg actually introduced me so in uh, 2016 um, we'd been making our Lloyd wine for about eight years, but we wanted to have something else at a different price point. Um, and that's where prescription came in. I've been working with a grower named James Reamer um, since 2010, making Chardonnay for another brand that, uh, that I used to own. Um, and with prescription, that's actually what Greg and I are drinking right now. There so, you know, he's got a neat little vineyard um, up by kind of Sacramento. Hey, why, thank you, sir. May I have another? Want some more? Oh, I would like some more. Thank you. you. Um, so it's a tough, tough job we have here today. Um, so with prescription, you know, we're basically making the wine uh, in stainless tanks um, and then adding a little bit of, uh, you know, oak in to basically co-ferment with it to absorb some of the those toasty oak flavors. Um, whereas with Lloyd, I mean, it's all barrel fermented and um, all the grapes are coming from Carneros. So let's kind of keep cruising on through these. Yeah. There's another nice picture of prescription. That's much nicer than one Greg and I tossing up here while pouring our wine into our glass. Well, let's kind of keep flipping through these. So, well, here's what I was just talking about earlier. So <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we warned you ladies that we were not very good at staying on script. So. <laughs> Constantly going off. Script. And you too, Jeff. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, but with, with prescription, I, I mean, I'm not even sure Hopefully everybody's got, you know, some prescription chard or Lloyd chard in their glass, but, you know, the prescription, you know, a little bit crisper, um, you know, not quite as heavy as, as the Lloyd Chardonnay, but at $20, you know, we've had, uh, had someone call me up and ask to buy some and they described uh, prescription as their Monday through Thursday Chardonnay. And then Lloyd was their Friday and Saturday Chardonnay. I don't know what they were drinking on Sunday, but, um, you know, just a little bit lighter style, you know, a little bit crisper. All right, and so here's a picture of James Vineyard. So with this fruit, um, you know, just up there, it's interesting because normally you think Sacramento, uh, a little bit warmer, you know, kind of like with Lodi, but where this vineyard is, there's all these deep water channels and the vineyard is below the channels and that cold air comes in from the ocean kind of up through those channels and then just falls down into the vineyard. So. Um, where normally I'm harvesting our Carnero stuff that has a San Pablo Bay influence, kind of almost beginning October. Um, I always thought that this area would be too warm, but I harvest these grapes about two weeks before. So uh, it, it is able to keep, and the reason that cold is good with wine grapes, as they're ripening, you have sugar going up, but you tend to lose the acid. And if you have really cold nights, it's able, you, the grapes are able to keep that acid. Um, you know, I actually, before I came to Irvine, I lived in a town called Visalia in Central California in Fresno. And Fresno, great for table grapes, but at night it's too warm. So you actually lose that acidity in those grapes, which is why you don't see 
as many high-end wines coming from Fresno. Um, but with this area, because of that, you know, the, those deep water channels at night, it's able to cool off those grapes. And so we can keep that really nice natural acidity level in the wine, which if you're chugging it like Greg and I are, you can taste. <laughs> Here. Oh, just then, there you go. Look, deep water channels. Man, I actually am staying somewhat yeah, on like script. Suit, sir. I know, it's amazing sometimes. So, <laughs> oh, and, so, and then here are some nice little scores. We've gotten some nice write-ups from other people that like chugging the wine as much as Greg and I do. Another nice, pretty picture. So this is um, our prescription Cabernet. So we make uh, roughly about 10,000 cases of the prescription Chardonnay. So it's a, it's a decent amount with the Cabernet. Um, we don't make as much. We only make about 500 to 1,000 cases. And this was because the uh, knucklehead to my left, uh, to your right, um, he kept telling me that we needed to have a very nice Cabernet to go along with the Chard. And this is a vineyard that I've worked with for uh, 12 years now. It's uh, normally used to make uh, $70 Cabernets that I make for other clients. Don't tell them. Um, this is, I think, well, we'll probably get you another slide. It's 30 retail, 30, $30 retail. So very, very nice high end fruit. It's about 1700 foot elevation. Um, actually, I mean, here, this is looking, actually, this is looking from the vineyard back down into the Alexander Valley. So Alexander Valley is just a little bit north of Napa and a little bit more to the west. But um, the, this vineyard is crazy. I mean, if you trip, you're going to roll down about a hundred yards uh, until it ends because it's very, very steep, um, but it's almost uh, reminds me of like a moon crater. Um, so a really special vineyard that if this uh, vineyard was said Napa on it, this would probably be about a $90 Cabernet, but because it says Alexander Valley, it's 30. So if anyone out there has it, it's really good for the price. I just can't make much more. Boop. And then more about what I was talking about. So, <laughs> and uh, this is not a picture of our grapes. Our grapes, uh, the, that those pictures uh, show kind of what most Cabernet grapes. The, these, the grapes are about probably about half that size um, that are up there, just because of that hillside. Normally, you know, you'll get about I don't know five tons per acre. Uh, the fruit that we get there is about a ton and a half. So, because of that hillside and because of being up at 1700 foot elevation uh, just doesn't set as much of a crop. And the beauty of small berries is when you're making red wines, um, the juice is all clear for almost all varietals, almost all red varietals. But if you have a lot of skins, very little juice, you get a much more concentrated wine. And so with, uh, with this vineyard, getting those really teeny berries, you get a lot more skins, uh, a lot less uh, juice, and you can really get some nice concentration in the wine. And all the five adults that are sitting here listening to this are going, oh my God, that guy actually knows what the hell he's talking about now. Well, a lot more than you did when, about the Boone's Farm. Oh know? yeah, yeah. Yeah, they actually remember when I you know, would drink a bottle of Boone's Farm on the way to the party and then use that bottle of Boone's Farm to fill up with beer. I got a, yeah, there are a couple of, you know, memories that are you know, starting to <laughs> flood back as we're doing this. Never knew if it really so, had strawberries. In it. No, I don't think it had any strawberries in it. So, you know, again, some nice write-ups from some people for the wine. And now getting into Lloyd. So should we, you know, start drinking? We're going to have to chug this and start drinking some of our Lloyd wine. So the, the Lloyd, um, you know, basically when I left Rombauer, my wife convinced me to start my own business. Uh, thank God for her because I wouldn't have definitely a little scary going out on her own and starting. But um, when I left, I took my two favorite vineyards that I was making Rombauer Chardonnay with, and that's what we started to make the Lloyd wines with. So um, difference with the Lloyd, it's uh, all uh, Napa and Sonoma Carneros. This is kind of showing you Carneros. If you look over there, you can see the San Pablo Bay. Um, that's the cool air that comes in at night that keeps that area cold. And again, the cold nights are what keeps the, the acid in the wines so that it doesn't taste flabby because uh, no one likes flabby. And I won't get into other flabby things that no one likes. So maybe we better go before Talk I start about talking about that. Me. Yeah. So <laughs> soils and Carneros. So Carneros, a lot of clay. Um, and that, that clay uh, basically kind of will help hold some water. Um, and the clay also, it was interesting when I was at uh, UC Davis, 
I was trying to make a wine that tasted like Rombauer Chardonnay. Um, the way you get some of that big, rich butteriness is there's a, an acid called malic acid. And uh, if the malic acid is high, when you finish the primary ferment, which is yeast eating sugar, creating Greg's favorite alcohol, uh, a little bit of heat and carbon dioxide, um, there's a secondary bacterial fermentation that is converts malic acid, which malic uh, tastes like a, like a green apple acid, really crisp. And uh, the bacteria converts it into lactic acid or kind of like a milk acid, much softer. And that's really where that, that, that process of going from malic to lactic um, is where you get the, the buttery component of Chardonnays. And if you guys are uh, chugging the Lloyd Chardonnay, like Greg and I will be as soon as I stop talking, um, that's where you get that really big, rich kind of finish that uh, Jim Kwan's wife likes. Uh, Sable's not as big of a fan of the Chardonnay, but don't worry, we're going to get into Pinot here in a little bit for you, Sable, and you'll be fine. Uh, so San Giacomo Vineyards here, the site's uh, three different vineyards, and it's really kind of, you know, this is part of why I got into wine. I was just fascinated. I mean, you know, there's just so many different things you can do to make wine, um, where you grow the grapes, when you pick the grapes. And with San Giacomo Vineyards, they have about a thousand acres down in uh, Carneros, but the home ranch, Green Acres and Keyser, they're all within almost kind of stone's throw from each other, but um, Green Acres and Home Ranch, the main two, one is situated north, south, uh, the other one east, west. And it's amazing how, you know, that difference makes, you know, will, will give me different grapes. Home Ranch is really the body of the wine, whereas Green Acres gives a little bit more of that, uh, that kind of, you know, a little bit more crispness, a little bit more of that green apple flavors. And hens and chicks. Everybody likes the hens and chicks. So hens and chicks, um, uh, one of the vineyards I sourced from uh, the True Shards over in Napa Carneros, uh, the hens are the normal size berries, chicks, the little ones. Basically, it's just um, sterile um, grape cluster. So the, the ones that are small, they have no seeds. And you do get a little bit, a touch more acid, but you really get a lot more flavor in those um, just because you have some of those teeny little berries, uh, very little skins. Kind of keep cruising. Oh, look, at, they like this one even more. So got 94 points. So, um, you know, the Lloyd Shard, it is, this is really kind of, I guess, our flagship wine. Flagship. This is the wine that we make the most of. Um, and, you know, I don't doubt anyone's been able to chug prescription and chug Lloyd Chard this fast because even I can't, but I'm talking. So I, I have an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> and now getting into uh, the Pinot. So, um, you know, when we started in 2008, um, I did two vintages of just Chardonnay under our Lloyd label while trying to find, I need a spit bucket because otherwise I'm going to have to chug. But um, here, you chug for me. So with the... Uh, so with the Pinot, it took me two years to find a vineyard that I liked, um, but I love the Santa Rita Hills Appalachian <laughs> up above Santa Barbara. Uh, and again, this is the beauty of wine grapes, wherever you grow them, uh, it will give you different flavors, uh, just kind of like, you know, if you are having, oh, I'd love some Pinot. Thank you, sir. I have another, um, you know, but with the Pinot, Santa Rita Hills, you get a little bit more brambly, spicy type flavors. Um, that's what I like. So with this, um, I'll check on the vineyard throughout the year and then go down a little bit before harvest and we'll pick the grapes at night, put them into a refrigerated truck and bring them up to the winery in Napa. Um, and then we'll do open top fermentation with this. Um, and I developed actually a, a unique device called Submerge Cap, which is basically like a uh, French press um, for a coffee, but it holds the skins underneath and then uses a natural carbon dioxide to kind of you know constantly mix these these skins, so you get a lot of a um, lot of flavor. So for 100% Pinot, uh, you know as you can see here, color very dark and pretty big for for a Pinot. It is not a Burgundy style lighter Pinot. It's it's a big ass Pinot, and that's a great vineyard. We'll move on to the next slide. There we go. Oh, there we go again. So night pick. So night picking um, is great. Um, you know, if you pick when it's warmer, skins are softer. When you put all those grape clusters into the bin, they will juice themselves uh, due to the weight and you start having skin and juice contact too early and you can actually have 
uh, native ferment starch, which we don't like. So at night it's cold, skins are firmer. Um, and then plus the nice thing is at, you know, even just during a 24 hour period with grapes during the day, sugar start to go up, acid levels drop a bit, but at night the acids come back. And so by picking at night, you get a little, you retain a little bit more of the natural acidity. Oh, hey, there's, I forgot we had a picture. So there's a subcap. So the subcap, you know, again, this is a picture looking into the open top tank that has that uh, basically French press type device uh, that I had made. And so it's holding all those skins underneath. Um, and the nice thing about that, you know, one, the skins are constantly getting mixed, but two, um, kind of like the uh, ball guy going skiing and taking his hat off, with this, we're able to release a lot of not only carbon dioxide, but I'm also able to vent ethanol. So I can pick the, the wine, these grapes at a little bit riper sugar, but I'll still lose a little bit more ethanol. So like if I ferment the Chardonnay at about 50 degrees Fahrenheit in barrels for the Lloyd Chard, and I pick at 25 bricks, bricks is a, a sugar scale measurement. Um, but if I pick it at 25 bricks, I'll make a wine at probably 15.3 ethanol. If I pick the Pinot at the same, the Pinot would probably finish at about 13.4 ethanol. So I can lose almost 2% uh, ethanol by using this device. So it allows me to get a little bit riper flavors, um, but not have to add any water because uh, if anyone out there is adding water into their wine, I will, or sugar or ice cubes, I'll shoot you. Uh, that goes for you, Quan. Uh, don't do it. But um, this allows me to be able to lose some of the ethanol. Uh, without having to lose any of the concentration in the wine. So it, I started playing around with it about 16 years ago, and it's kind of become definitely a unique style of wine that we make. So, and again, hey, it's a nice course. Thank you, one enthusiast and tasting panel. So I'm running out of energy talking because I need to start drinking again. All right, <laughs> here, you say this part, then I can take a sip. Yeah, some of you went on on the website and caught some wine to drink along with us. But if um, if you didn't, if if you uh, go to LloydSellers.com, um, actually the here's the hidden link. Um, we can send that to you if you don't have if you don't have it. Email uh, info at Lloyd Sellers or Greg G R E G two G's one at the beginning, one at the end at LloydSellers.com, and I can send you this link. Um, and we're going to extend the promo code through December 7th. So all the um, sales and profits off of these sales will go to UCI Alumni Association and Phi Delta Theta, California yep. Theta chapter. So we, we <laughs> figured we'd you know, do a little giving back to you know, the college that we met and uh, the fraternity where we met. And what better way to do it by drinking? Yeah. Now, thank you to everyone who attended tonight. Uh, we're going to be in touch with you, uh, uh, Ryan, to to get your uh, preferred mailing address so we can send your goodies. But but yeah, we hope everyone enjoyed your your time with us this evening. Uh, obviously, a tremendous thanks to Rob and Greg. This was a, a dedicated time for them, and uh, you know they they're great alumni wanting to kind of get get out and do a fun event for other alumni. So we appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for doing this. Mm -hmm.